won't make my mind up till after the uh, 2014 election. And I'll have more clarity on after this midterm. Not going to make a decision till later this year. That decision hasn't been made. I just want to kind of get through this year. I'll make a decision after the first of the year. Okay, so I guess we can say it's official right now. This election tonight, the starting gun of 2016. Everyone waiting until then to make their decision to announce what they're going to do. Diane Sawyer is here to break down all of the possible candidates with us in just a second. But we want to start out first with uh, the data streaming in right now on Facebook. Alicia Menendez has gone over to the election social square right now, and she's re releasing our brand new ABC News partnership with Facebook. This is the first time Facebook has cracked the code, tracking the feelings of everyone on their social network. And Elisa, what you, one of the things you're seeing right now is how people are feeling about these biggest names looking at the White House in 2016. That's right, George. We've never done this before, and Facebook has never done this before. Facebook scientists that sounds like a cool gig, have taken all of your conversations surrounding the elections, analyzed them, and have come back with the pulse of the nation. When it comes to potential 2016 presidential candidates, here's what you guys are saying. You look at someone like Chris Christie, 45% of the conversation around him is positive, 46% negative, 8% neutral. Jeb Bush, very similar numbers, 46% of the Facebook conversations positive, 50% negative, 5% neutral. Rand Paul, 60% positive, 37% negative, 4% neutral. And then Hillary Clinton, 59% of the conversation on Facebook positive, 37% negative, 3% neutral. George? And that is the Facebook sentiment. We're going to track that all through the 2015 and 2016 campaign. Diane's here as well, looking at the exit polls and what they say about these candidates as well, potential candidates. Potential candidates, I've got a number for you. 454 days, everybody, till the Iowa <laughs> caucuses. Get in training now. Are you ready? And as we know, the arc bends tonight toward the presidential election. And we wanted to know what the candidates can take away from the voters today. So let's start with what the Democrats were saying about a Democratic candidate. We're talking about the person at the center of the stage for them, Hillary Clinton, of course. The Democrats coming out of the booth said 80 percent, by 80 percent, that she would make a good president. And what were Republicans saying about Republicans? Well, that's not just a big, wide field of Republicans. It's kind of a galactically wide field coming up. But these are some of the best-known names. And get potential candidates. Jeb Bush, 49, good president. Chris Christie, 35. And these are Republicans on Republicans. Rand Paul, 39. Rick Perry, 41. And that's just the beginning of the field. This is just one bunched-up field right there. I, I got to take this to David Fluff, because you had that Hillary number mm -hmm. right there. Eighty percent of Democrats think she'd be a good candidate. David, it was reported, of course, as you said, you've, you ran President Obama's campaign, ran against uh, Hillary Clinton. But it was reported recently that you actually went to her and said, you know what? Don't play around anymore. Get in this race. It's time to run. Don't fake it. Is that true? Well, there was a lot in that report that probably wasn't true. But I will say this. I think that it's interesting. If you look at the President Clinton, 1995 was as important to him as his re-election year. For George Bush, it was 2003. President Obama took, I think, smart advantage of 2011. So, you know, she'll, I'm sure she'll have some candidates run against her, but she's in a dominant position. So she's got an ability, I think, to really get ahead of the game here and understand how you're going to win these battleground states, how you're going to frame the race. And so it would be a shame to let that time go away. And that, that's one view of it. I want to go to Matthew Dad and say the flip side of that is that, you know, you see all this anger at incumbents out there. You see all this anti-establishment anger out there. Do you want to be hanging out there that long as the ultra-prohibitive frontrunner? Well, I think that her, she and her folks are going to be looking at this tonight. They know they're the dominant Democrat in the field, but the problem she has is this is election, along with a number of other elections that have happened, says we don't want the status quo. We don't want Washington experience. We're tired of the way it operates. And she's going to have to figure out, having been in Washington for basically 20 years, or more than 20 years, how she separates from that. She also has to figure out what she does with President Obama. She was beat by President Obama in 2008. She could be beat by President Obama again in 2016 if she doesn't figure out how to thread that needle. She also has to figure out, Diane Sawyer, and you have some numbers on this as well, what kind of an economic agenda she comes up with. If she's going to get any kind of a challenge uh, inside the Democratic Party, it's probably going to be from the left, probably from the populist left on economic issues. And she had a chance to refine her speech when she's out of the campaign trail. Just one note, we saw saw my interview with her go by there at the beginning of the summer when I did that interview. So many questions about her health. She traveled to 20 states, 
20,000 miles. It was a pounding marathon out there, and there aren't the questions about our health now. But back to this economic question, because you're right. It's not just people talking about their current financial situation, but it's really the question about fairness in America. And do they believe that the economic dream can still be achieved by hard work for themselves and for their children? And so we ask a question about the nationwide economic system. And here's what people said coming out of the polls. Is it fair or does it favor the wealthy? And you can see it's 63-32 there, two to one, saying that it favors the wealthy. And it seems to argue for the opportunity for a populist candidate. Maybe. Like Elizabeth Warren, although she said she's not going to run. I wanted to turn to the Republican side right now. Nicole Wallace, of course, you're very close. You used to work for go former Governor Jeb Bush mm -hmm. as well. To the extent there's any big McGill on the Republican side, aside from Mitt Romney, who says he's not going to run, he's right. actually leading our polls. It's Jeb Bush everyone is waiting for, but he could end up having a similar difficulty as Hillary Clinton. Again, that name has been around for so long. Well, Martha keeps talking about how terrorism played in this election. I think one of the interesting opportunities for Republicans, we haven't been able to do this for a couple of cycles, but is to advance a very, very clear and concise message about America's role in the world. President Obama hasn't done this to the degree that I think some people thought he would after big speeches in Egypt. He hasn't really rushed onto the world stage with the crisis in Russia. Republicans, especially someone like Jeb Bush, who has has traveled the world, has a father and a brother who served as president, has an opportunity. And, and I have to just say about Jeb Bush, I believe his son George P. Bush is poised to win his first statewide office in Texas as Texas Land Commissioner. So it is a huge yeah. night. It is a huge <laughs> night in the Jeb Bush household, not just because he, and I think Jeb was a surrogate. He did 28 events for candidates who have so far, I think, have fared pretty well. But Jeb has a great opportunity to be the Republican that, that sort of rushes in and seizes the opportunity to stake out a very clear role for the party and the country on the world stage and who has used Florida as a great laboratory for his economic policy that's and the pro, education policy. That's the pro argument for Jeb Bush. I'm going to go to Bill Crystal right here. He's also taken on <laughs> the conservative base of the party on the issue of taxes, core. on the issue of immigration, on the issue of Common Core and education. Is this the year, you know, usually Republicans elect the, it's been the man, the man next in line for the nomination. Is this the year that that pattern breaks? This is the year the Democrats nominate the woman next in line, the woman who lost eight years ago, sort of the way the Republicans usually nominate the most recent second place runner, the runner up in the most recent primary. Incidentally, after David went to see Secretary Clinton, she did call me. I want to report here on ABC <laughs> News, and but I, I can't report my out of my conversation. It was truly <laughs> confidential with her, and gave her, I gave her some good advice. Um, look, I don't think Jeb. So Jeb Bush is free to run, but he'll have to make a case. And look, he's going up against people like Scott Walker, elected three times in the last four years in Wisconsin, a conservative reform governor, John Kasich, a more moderate governor, elected re-elected by what 15 points or something like that tonight in the state of Ohio. Marco Rubio, Ted Cruz, people who have been in the fight the last six years, either at the state level or the federal level. I think the tough thing for Jeb Bush to say to Republicans who have been so engaged in fighting back against President Obama and his agenda is, well, why should we go back 10 years? With all due respect, you were a good governor of Florida. We admire your family, but why go back 10 years to nominate you? Uh, George, I think one thing that Americans are going to look at, they're going to think there's 330 million Americans here. Are we going to do Bush Clinton again? I mean, I think there's a sense of, is that really going forward? Are we going to rerun this race one more time? I think both of them are going to have to deal with that fatigue. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no question about that, David. Plott. But I, I do think, I think Matthew makes a very good point, but I do think that the electorate that's going to show up two years from now is fundamentally different than the one you saw tonight. The Republicans are having a good night tonight. Much more diverse, much younger. And so, so it's going to take someone like a Jeb Bush who seems different than the Tea Party, willing to stand up to the Republican establishment. A candidate like that will get a serious look from swing voters because they're hungry for that. If you nominate someone who just, you know, checks all the extreme positions in a Republican Tea Party primary, I think that person's going to have a hard time winning a presidential election in the year 2016. This is Jeb Bush's problem. David Pluff endorses Jeb Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and David, you've been taking a look at the age of the electorate there. Yeah, we know the midterms are so different from the presidential election, so just take a look at the age here. 23 percent, 65 and older. That's the highest number, the highest percentage we've seen in a midterm, dating back to 1992 with these exit polls. And look at this, 13 percent, 18 to 29. We know that's down from 19 percent during the presidential election. We know that the young people don't come out in these midterms in, in the numbers that we see in the presidential years, uh, but a very different electorate at midterms than, than during the presidential. We have a very big projection coming in right now. It comes from the state of Georgia. It's in the Senate race, and you've got David Perdue right there. He has defeated 
He has defeated Michelle Nunn. Over 50% of the vote you're seeing in there right now. This is a big, big call, a big hold for the Republicans. John Carl. The reason why this is so big is the Democrats had two big chance to knock off Republicans uh, to get seats that were held by Republicans in, of course, in Georgia and also uh, in Kentucky. And both have failed and seem to fail pretty big. So right now, uh, the only drama there is left is, is in, in the state of Kansas, where Pat Roberts is running against an independent and seems to be having a lead there. But it looks like Democrats will come up empty-handed entirely on the Senate. Nate Silver, we only have about 30 seconds right here. What does this do to your projections? Um, so this is one of the races we thought would go to Republicans, and the chances are going to be probably above 90% once we update the model. Hmm. Above 90% right now, Republicans well on their way. Five of the six seats they need right now. It has been a great night as voters make their voices heard across this country. The votes are still being counted. We're gonna stay here all night long, continue to follow it all. Follow us online, it's election 2014.